Pretty. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, present the data about the target A trial. And uh, I shall try and explain some background about the process, how we got, it, got to it, and try and compare it with contemporary uh, clinical trial results. So this photograph is of the main people who wrote, who uh, wrote the drafts and the writing committee, but all the authors are listed on the right hand side. And these are the authors of the last BMJ publication. So, um, so this is the International Steering Committee, which uh, looked after the trial in the initial years, and then the Independent Trial Steering Committee, uh, appointed by the HTA, uh, which contains 75% um, independent members, uh, looked after the governance of the trial since the last publication. Uh, acknowledgements are really due to every set team in each of these 33 hospitals and each patient who participated in the trial without whose uh, um, continuous dedication, we couldn't have done this trial. And this was not an industry sponsored trial at all. So it was everybody's uh, fire in the belly that made it happen. So these are the photographs of all the, um, all the authors in the BMJ paper. Of course, each one of them represents a team who worked with them uh, tirelessly. And you can read much more about this on the website target.org.uk. So the target A randomized trial asked a simple question is whether risk adapted single dose target IORT during lumpectomy could effectively replace three to six weeks of daily post drugs radiotherapy. Is everything okay? Yes, fine. Yeah, okay, so this is my potential conflict of interest is uh, we received grant funding from Department of Health of UK NIHR HTA program and I receive some honoraria whenever uh, I have to give when I have sometimes when I have to give lectures. Um, and there is some travel reimbursement from Carl Zeiss. So going from uh, what has happened with breast cancer is that over the last 100 years we have moved from in the 1894 when William Halstead published his first uh, paper about radical mastectomy, and I have done these operations in Tata Hospital, to more targeted um, surgery where we do only a lumpectomy. You can hardly see the scar in this patient of mine. And this is since 1995, we moved from radical radiotherapy, which irradiates the whole breast, to more targeted radiotherapy. And this has taken over the last 25 years. And this is a story of 25 years. I'll try and tell you in, in 25 minutes. So it started for me at least uh, when I was a chief resident in Tata Memorial Hospital in Bombay. And uh, of course we had color photographs that time, but it's nice to show a black and white photograph. And uh, 1991, there was a stamp by government of India about Tata Hospital. So when I was working there, patients would come from all over India and I would tell them, you have breast cancer. And in the same breath, I would ask them, can you come to the hospital every day for six weeks of radiotherapy after the operation is done? This, was, this had to be discussed just after their diagnosis was given to them. And if they said, yes, they can stay in Bombay. And many times these patients would stay on and around the roads around the hospital. It was quite terrible. But if they can stay in Bombay for six weeks, yes, we could preserve your breast. But if they have to go back to their home in uh, somewhere in North India, Bihar, or elsewhere, where they had to go and look after their family and not stay in Bombay for one month or two, one and a half months, then you would say, well, actually it's a package deal. We really can't do only a lumpectomy. We have to do a mastectomy. So they had to lose the breast. And it was not a nice thing for women. And it was a thing we had to do every day. And this is not limited to India. And I thought it was limited to India my colleagues from UCSF on the West Coast of America tell me that if he is in his university hospital, Michael Alvarado, the most patients will have a lumpectomy and radiotherapy. They can come to the hospital. But if they are on the other side in the county hospital, they don't want to cross the Bay Bridge every day for six weeks for having the radiotherapy. They say do a mastectomy instead. And this is a situation in Australia where people have to travel long distances. It's in Denmark where people don't want to leave their islands. It's there all over the world. And I'll show you how it is in UK as well. 
So this is not a unique problem to India at all. And uh, papers as late as 2015 have shown that a large proportion of people living far away from the hospital actually don't ever get the radiotherapy. So while whole breast radiotherapy is considered essential after lumpectomy, traveling daily for radiotherapy is onerous. So many have to choose a mastectomy. So we published papers back in 1995 and 96 and 97, which suggested that the breast has microscopic cancers in addition to the main cancer. But the local recurrence, paradoxically, occurs near the primary cancer. So this was the first time that we said this in uh, when I presented this in 1995 and then in published in British Journal of Cancer. And we said this in a letter in The Lancet. This is what led us to this academic insight to irradiate only the tumor bed during lumpectomy. And this academic insight led to collaboration with industry to make a device to test this new approach. So it was two things together, making a new device to give the radiation and testing whether giving radiation only around the tumor is good enough. So that collaboration, and then we tried started the randomized trial in 2020, in year 2000, sorry. So this was our multidisciplinary team 20 years ago. The people, main people involved here were uh, Professor Michael Baum, Professor uh, uh, Taylor was the head of the department. Professor Christopher Saunders is now in Australia. Professor Tobias, radiation oncologist. Dr. Neil Mitra, he was a visiting professor on that day. And uh, that's me there. So that was in March, 2000. And you can see how the operation uh, looks. That's the tumor bed and um, if there are radiation oncologists in the audience, they may have not seen this for many years, but you would have seen this in a, as a medical student. Is This applicator goes inside the tumor bed. This is a take photograph of the first patient done on 2nd of July. That photograph was taken in Italy when I went there to show them. That is Professor Baum and that's Professor Tobias in the operation theater. And as they, I expect some surgeons to be there in the audience, I want to show them uh, details of a case done recently. So this is a lumpectomy uh, operation. This tumor was very close to skin. So I took an ellipse of skin and we put them on this uh, type of a board to get all the margins clear. And then this is an X-ray taken of the specimen with the wire. So you can see there are clear margins that the tumor is in the center of the specimen. And once that is done, the surgeon has actually taken off the tumor. And the next step is to do the um, procedure for giving IORT. Now this is in some detail and we do this as a tutorial before any new center starts. And I prepared this to show the people. So you can see here, that's the tumor bed. The green is the tumor bed. Cancer has just been taken out. The red line is where the first string should be taken. It should not be too close to the dermis, but it should not be deep. So this is the wrong place to take it because as you tighten the first string, that tumor bed should surround the spherical applicator so that the applicator takes the place of the cancer specimen, right? So it is pliable, breast tissue is pliable and spherical. So it really fits nicely. You choose the correct size applicator. So you can see here now a video, a small video of the purse string being taken. So I have gone all, all the way around to the bottom of this wound. And now I'm taking the last two sutures, you can see on the upper part of the wound. Actually it's upper, but uh, patient's lower. So you can see that it is not it's too close to the skin. And when I take this bite, I make sure that I don't take the dermis in it because if I do, then it gets a large amount of radiation. And that could lead to radiation across of the skin. So you can see this bursting is taken now. And the next step is, sorry, look at this one now. So this is the, how the applicator is check that it's correct correct place, size of the applicator. This fits very nicely. And that's that's all that matters. And once that is done, the purse string is tied. And this photograph is from South Korea, uh, where you can see first it's inside, it's nicely placed, good at position. You can put dosimetry, uh, radiochromatic paper on the surface here. So we are doing this, the bottom photograph here, you can see it being done during COVID times with all the PPE. And that's how it looks in the operation theater with this machine sitting there, going in the patient, anesthetist stands behind a uh, lead shield or outside the room, outside the window. And that goes on for about 20 minutes, right? So, 
So that's how it is. So this technique was developed in London between 1996 to 98. The applicator goes to the bed, it's delivered immediately after an ampectomy. Okay, I wanted to show you something. Bed, and targets tissues at highest risk of relapse and avoids normal <laughs> tissue. <laughs> tissue <laughs> So the principle of precision and immediacy. And we have tumor sizes from 1.5 to 5 centimeter applicators. So 5 centimeter applicator can easily uh, give radiation to a tumor bed of about 4 centimeter, uh, four, three and a half centimeter tumor. So that's why the upper limit of the tumor size is three and a half centimeters. And in India, at least 10 years ago, the median tumor size was 3.5 centimeters, which means half the patients would be immediately eligible for this, depending on the size of the breast, of course. So this patient's tumor was 25 millimeter grade two invasive ductal carcinoma. Some portions were grade three with some DCIS. It was completely excised. And as I suspected, the anterior margin was the closest. It was good to have taken the skin. DCIS margin was five millimeters. Central node was negative. So this patient did not need any further radiotherapy, particularly important in COVID times. And essentially, we are going to do some gene expression analysis to assess whether she needs radiotherapy or not, because she's only 50. Um, and otherwise, she would simply need to take endocrine therapy. So the surgical technique was published. And the first 25 patients using this technique was published to confirm its safety. And then we uh, wrote the protocol and started the randomized trial in March 2000. So this trial compared two approaches. This is not pure target IORT with EBRT, but risk adapted target IORT with EBRT. And that was the comparison. What will happen in real life is that some patients, and in those days we used to do, have to give a diagnosis using fine needle aspiration cytology. So if you had fine needle aspiration cytology, sometimes you would get a cancer diagnosis, but it would turn out to be a lobular uh, cancer later on. So uh, therefore, um, Sorry, this needs to be. Sorry, I better stop this noise. Um, so if you had some unexpected pathology, such as the lobular cancer, multiple positive margins or multiple lymph nodes, but the multiple lymph nodes was not even in the, um, in the protocol. It's lobular cancer, EIC or margin. Then they would have re-excision of margins and whole breast radiotherapy. And if they're lobular cancers, they would be recommended whole breast radiotherapy. So, and we expected this number to be 20% and which is what happened in real life. So 80% of the patients received just IORT. The first results were published in 2010. And at that time, Lancet put our conclusion on the front page saying that for selected patients with early breast cancer, a single dose target IORT should be an alternative to whole breast radiotherapy. So we then continued our follow-up and while waiting for longer term results, we said, let us see, um, people analyzed the obvious benefit of target, are they really present or not? So this was in 2003 and 2013, where the cosmetic outcome was confirmed to be superior with target IORT. The quality of life also was found to be superior, the cosmesis and quality of life. And these studies are done in Australia and in Germany, where uh, cosmetic outcome and breast-related quality of life and radiotherapy-related quality of life were all superior with intraoperative radiotherapy. One would say that's obvious, but it was confirmed. Patients have less pain with target IORT and have less breast and arm symptoms as well. So the quality of life these will impact on is improved. What about preference? So we assumed that there, would, there might be higher local recurrence rate with target IORT, but despite that, patients preferred IORT and doctors preferred it for themselves. So these questions were asked in America and in Australia, and there both patients and doctors or doctors, if they became patients, would have preferred to have target IORT. And people were happy to accept a margin of between two and a half to 10%. So median was about two and a half percent. In terms of cost, now this is a paradoxical thing, is that this is new treatment, which is better for the patient, but it costs less. And in the US, if this is implemented to all patients, then it would save $1.4 billion in five years. So this is a large amount of cost saving for the health system. 
And this is true even for UK. So in UK, the cost saving is less because cost of uh, radiotherapy, which is they don't have, is much, much less in the UK. So whether it's $20,000, it would cost $4,000 in the UK. So therefore the cost saving is less in the UK, but this, is, this has had a paradoxical effect. It could have a paradoxical effect. If the NHS or the insurance company is saving money, where is the money being saved? The hospital makes less money. And strangely, I'm not saying this, but it could have had uh, an opposite effect uh, of adopt in terms of adoption. It reduces patients' travels to the hospital. Now, this is obvious. 80% of the times, patients don't have to make any extra visit to the hospital. So we did the actual calculation in these hospitals in those in Target A trial and UK and two NHS hospitals. And what we found is that in Swindon and in the, this, if you look at this map of UK, you'll be surprised that each circle represents a radiotherapy center. Each circle is 13 miles. So people in the green parts have to travel more than 13 miles to get to radiotherapy every day, right? So um, I'm going to stop sharing for a second, uh, open a new uh, video and um, send you the, show you the, um, show you how it looks. And this was an interesting, uh, right, so I'll share. Can listen to this. At least three or four weeks um, for their radiotherapy. I realized that while I'd be driving this only once or twice a month, most of my patients would be asked to drive this at least three or four weeks um, for their radiotherapy. What a horrible journey I thought they had to put up with. Okay, so this is Mr. Nathan Coombs uh, explaining how, um, can you see the screen now? Yeah? Yes, okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, you could see that video, could you? Yes, sir, we saw it. <laughs> okay, okay, good. So in theory, it could reduce global warming. In practice, 750 miles of travel would typically be avoided with 30 hours of traveling and 215 kilograms of carbon dioxide to a typical patient in the UK, and it might be much more in other parts of the world. Target also improves tumor microenvironment. So this is scary for any surgeon that when you do an operation, postoperatively, fluid collects in the wound. And this fluid is all conducive to, for tumor, not for tumor, for uh, healing of the wound. Now in the process, it's also conducive for tumor. It increases proliferation, motility, and invasiveness. And this work was done in Italy by Dr. Masaruth and Dr. Baldassare's team. What was found is that we took fluid from patients' wounds and put them on cell lines and they promoted proliferation, motility, and invasiveness. We took fluid from patients who had target IORT and this stimulation was abrogated. You'll give an example here. You can see how the control without surgery is that we need to do surgery, it goes up, and that is when you IORT. The top, top panel is of those patients without IORT, bottom panel where all the movement is now reduced is of patients who have had target IORT. So it makes the tumor microenvironment less conducive for cancer growth. So our paper, second paper was published in 2013, where we gave five-year local control and first-time survival results but breast cancer has a long natural history. So long-term outcomes are important. First patient was randomized in March, 2000, and the data log for this analysis was on 3rd of July, 2019. So we have a long follow-up now, but what we wanted to make sure is that the follow-up is complete. And for this, we set the bar really very high. And I haven't said, seen this bar high in any other trial. The bar was, we will only unblind when the follow-up is considered complete, which is if 95% patients had at least five-year follow-up and 90% patients had either 10-year follow-up or had been seen in the previous year, okay? So everybody couldn't have had 10-year follow-up because last patient was randomized in 2012. 
So at least 95 patient had to have five year follow-up and our primary endpoint was at five years. So and I'll give you an example here. We have lost two patients. I'm so sorry about that. One has immigrated to Finland and one have immigrated to Bulgaria. And this is out of how many patients? As out of uh, 534 patients, we have lost two. And I'm so sorry for that. I'm trying to get data on the lady who uh, immigrated to Finland. I got a phone number, but she don't pick up the phone. But the one who immigrated to Bulgaria, I'm sorry to say, I think I lost her. Oh. <laughs> you see, this is Dr. Henrik Pleiger, who is the surgeon and his head of the, his director of the hospital now. And uh, this is how personally each PI managed to get data from every patient. And uh, people all around the world helped with the trial center C2 team at uh, the Surgical Intervention Trials Unit at UCL, which is what made this happen uh, to get to this level. So this is the level where you can see the actual follow-up so close to the expected follow-up in each of the randomized arms. The IORT group had slightly better follow-up, but the difference was not significant. So we can expect that the data answers analysis is going to be very robust. So in the process, uh, I'll say this again later on, is that target A has the largest amount of follow-up data amongst PBR trials for invasive breast cancer. You can see the total is the gray, red is number of patients with five-year follow-up and then so on until 12-year follow-up. So the 12-year follow-up of target A is more than the Budapest trial, the total size of the Budapest trial or the LEADS trial or the Christie Hospital trial. And um, the, the five-year follow-up is much, much more than the import low trial, for example, or the Jack Castro trial. So um, that's how the numbers are at present. The unblinded database was sent to the trial statistician in July last year after the statistical analysis plan was signed off by the chair of the independent TSC and a senior independent statistician. Let me remind you of the randomization into risk adapted target IORT versus EBRT and 2,298 patients. What I want to remind you here is that patients had to be more than 45 years with unifocal invasive breast cancer. Unifocal on clinical examination, routine imaging, MRI wasn't required. And the size had to be about three and a half centimeters, preferably less than three and a half centimeters. The first thing you do when you do a randomized trial analysis, you match whether two sides are matched equally or not. They are very well matched. What is important here to recognize that age and BMI, which are the factors, which are a significant proportion of the non-breast cancer death risk comes from age and BMI. The only other factors that are uh, is smoking and hypertension, but a trial of two and a half thousand patients where smoking and hypertension are very common, they're unlikely to be very different from the two groups. The tumor factors were also well matched. So now we have the advantages for the patient. Surgery and radiotherapy is completed at the same time, Cosmetic outcome is good and better, less pain, less complications. So all very good. But what is a patient thinking? What is my chance of living without the cancer coming back? Which is the most important question to answer when one answers about uh, trial results for this type of cancer trial. So the one thing that we had set the trial up for was for non-inferiority. And in terms of non-inferiority, we confirmed that non-inferiority of target in terms of IORT was proven. We set the margin at 2.5 and it was only 1.1% the difference. And this is seen better in this diagram. And this diagram is tells you the absolute raw numbers, no confusion with any statistics. So this is for every 100 patients, what happens to them? Because we have complete five-year follow-up, what happens to them at five years? We recognize that out of 100 people, 96 are alive if they receive target IORT, 95 if they receive whole breast, Two get a local, two, two are alive after local recurrence. With EBRT, it's one alive after local recurrence. Three get distant disease in each side. Four die with target IORT, and five would have died with EBRT. Most patients are alive and well without any problems. So for the patient on the left hand side, 80% of the times they would have finished their whole treatment during the operation itself. 20% would have had radiotherapy after surgery. And for EBRT, all of them would have needed taking radiotherapy post-operatively between three to six weeks. What are the long-term outcomes? 
So long-term outcomes in terms of local recurrence-free survival and invasive local recurrence-free survival, you can see the lines are absolutely on top of each other. There's no difference at all. And if you see mastectomy-free survival and distant disease-free survival, they're also like uh, on top of each other, no difference between the two arms. So the local control, local control, invasive local control, breast preservation, and distant control was no different between the two arms of the trial. Breast cancer mortality, this is a magnified view. You can see there is no difference between the two arms of the trial here. Now this is the uh, good result here, where as we had seen in the last analysis, non-breast cancer mortality was significantly lower with a p-value of 0 0.005 and hazard ratio of 0.59, a 40% reduction. So you can see the two lines are separating more and more as time goes, and that separation is there in the overall survival as well. So in 2000, first patient was randomized. In 2010, we had published the first paper. And in 2020, we have confirmed with median follow-up of nine years, maximum follow-up of 19 years, that breast cancer control is comparable with EBRT and there is with target IORT that is reduced non-breast cancer uh, mortality compared with EBRT. And this reduction in non-breast cancer mortality is mainly from um, cardiovascular causes, pulmonary causes, and other cancers. So this single slide shows you all the uh, four main outcomes with no difference in uh, local or distant control or breast preservation, but reduced mortality from causes other than breast cancer. And this difference in absolute terms at 12 years is 5.41 versus 9.85, a difference of four and a half years, uh, four and a half uh, at 12 years. Uh, of course, there is confidence interval around that, but that is not a small difference at all. Here are some important points that you might have heard about and I wanted to clarify. First point was when the last paper was published, they said the follow-up was not good enough. And I've shown how uh, the follow-up is really very long. The amount of follow-up data is really large. Now, this is another uh, point I want to stress. Target A was not a low-risk population. Target A had a broad inclusion criteria. There was substantial number of high-risk population here. And this is typical of the cohort seen in our breast clinics. 85% of, of the patients were under the age of 70. So they were not all young patients. Sorry, they were not all old patients. And that is the criteria used for all other trials of no radiotherapy. 20% patients had grade three cancers, which may be more in India, but this is typical of a Western breast clinic. 22% were node positive, which is not dissimilar to trials of sentinel node biopsy where 26% were node positive, which is a standard what we find in the, UK, in, in the Western world and 19% patients were ER and PR negative. Now, the analysis of subgroups for any of these is coming out, is submitted for publication. It's not yet published, but we really didn't find much difference. Other important point to make is that all these high-risk groups, which you see here, they did not receive external beam. So 78% of grade, grade three, 82% of ER negative, and 67% of node positive patients received only IORT. They didn't get supplemental EBRT at all. So for this group of patients, and we have published this, target IORT versus EBRT, local, local control was exactly equal. Was no difference, no statistical significant difference was found. So high risk patients did receive target alone, a high proportion of them. So there is this idea that target me, me gives such little radiation and is it really necessary for this group of patients? As I said, this is a significant proportion of high-risk patients. And you compare it with PRIME2 trial, for example, where 2% patients were grade three, whereas target A, 20% were grade three. None of the patients were node negative, node positive in PRIME2, whereas in target, 22% were node positive. So, and despite this, having a very low risk population in trials of no radiotherapy, CLGB, BASO2, PRIME2, they all tried to find older patients over 65, over 70, who would have low risk of local recurrence without radiotherapy. 
And what happened with target? Despite having a higher risk population, the local recurrence risk was two to three times lower than no radiotherapy. The other point of consideration is reduced mortality with target IORT. It is plausible. It is plausible because EBRT is shown to cause cardiac perfusion defects within six months. And the trial data that we have found is consistent with other PBI trials. So we did this meta-analysis, it was published in the Lancet, which showed that in fact, not only is there a reduction in breast cancer, non-breast cancer mortality, there was a reduction in overall mortality when you put the, all the PBI trials together. This reduction was mainly due to deaths, fewer deaths from cardiovascular and pulmonary causes and other cancers. Now this 4.4% difference, if you extrapolate to 20,000 women in the UK, it's an estimated 880 fewer deaths in the UK. Now, if a faulty car caused these 17 deaths per week, would it not be recalled? So I seriously think that this option must be given to suitable patients. Now, this is even more important in smokers. And this paper was published by the Early Breast Cancer Trialist Group, where they tried to estimate with modern radiation doses, how many patients would die because of lung cancer and heart attacks, just two things. And they estimated that 23%, a quarter of patients would die in 30 years. A woman at 50, by the time she reaches 80, cured of cancer, but a quarter of them would die because of lung cancer or heart attacks. And that is a 6% increase from what the background would have been of 17%. So about 17.4% would have died and that increases to 23%, a 6% increase because only of external beam radiotherapy with modern radiation doses. And that is not at all a small increase. And 6% cannot be the benefit of, of, uh, of uh, external beam. External beam increases survival by four times less than the, more, than the local recurrence by four is to one ratio. So for it to increase, reduce mortality by 6%, it would have to reduce local recurrence by 24% in absolute terms. And that is not what it can ever do for early breast cancer or any breast cancer for that matter. So giving target IORT to smokers will reduce overall mortality by 6%. And I ask whether is it ethical at all for any smoker who has developed early breast cancer to be given whole breast radiotherapy, which will lead to so many deaths in, um, in 30 years time. And this is a paper from the uh, EBCTCG from Oxford. Yet another point is people are thinking because of COVID, let us give radiotherapy with the fast forward technique. Now people have, and even the authors have said in the BMJ that fast forward is partial breast radiation. It is not. Fast forward was whole breast radiation. It was not partial breast at all. And it takes seven to 15 extra hospital visits. Which is, which is a risk to patients when they're traveling during COVID times. It is irradiates the whole breast. There is scattered irradiation to vital organs. And in this trial, which was large, they did not find any reduction in mortality. It requires, it, and also about a quarter of patient with fast forward trial found in the fast forward protocol, found a hardened and firm breast, which is quite a lot, is not what we normally see in normal radiotherapy. And this is consistent with the physician assessment of 19 cents higher breast in duration. And this is, will get worse with time. So this is a comparison with whole breast fast forward regimen over five days of radiation, but one more visit for consultation and for planning and versus target A trial, which is partial breast. So this is the comparison, whole breast radiotherapy, whereas this is targeted to tumor bed. You can see how well the population of fast forward compares with population in target A. Age was very similar. Grade was slightly worse here, but node positivity was more worse in target. Despite that, the recurrence rate at five years was very similar. So it was an effective treatment. So, and, but it did not require all those hospital visits. 80% of the times it will be done during the surgery. Long-term outcomes of fast forward are not available. They have five-year results. At six years, the number of people who are continuing to follow up is reduced drastically. And long-term, we found no difference in cancer control, but reduction in other deaths. There is scatter radiation with, to other organs with fast forward, which isn't the case with IORT. 
and there is significant reduction in a randomized trial, and there is more toxicity, uh, which is not there, which is improved with target. Uh, this table is complicated, but these are all the trials of partial breast radiation of three different types. One is intraoperative, one is post -proce second procedure with uh, interstitial, and third one is post-operative external beam. Now I want to focus on two, two aspects. One, a small aspect is this is a technique which is in Jack Estro trial. And what they did not compare is how many holes are left behind which lead to scars. And that has not been assessed during their cosmetic outcome analysis. So uh, it is really quite nasty for a woman. And this is a photograph which patients should be shown, these photographs, and then given a choice of which one they would want. And the Jack Estro trial had just 784 patients at six years compared to nearly two and a half, three times more in the uh, target A trial. And as you can see, the numbers are much larger here with this. So the numbers are better. And I'm going to compare it with the import low trial, which is the only one where it is used in the UK for partial breast. As I said, the population is at medium risk. So it can be given to most patients in the clinic whereas you have to be highly selective for other types of partial breast radiation. Non-inferiority was proven and breast cancer control was similar and it's finished during the operation. And in terms of, sorry, this is, in terms of toxicity is lower where there was no difference in other trials, but here there was less toxicity reported, but wire entry scarring was not reported there's a reduction in non-breast cancer mortality, which is not seen in the PBI trials. And there is scatter irradiation with interstitial quite a lot, NSABP balloon quite a lot, and all the external beam radiotherapy. There is scatter irradiation to lung and the heart. And there are of course more hospital visits for every one of these apart from the intraoperative ones. And this last part really is uh, much more important in COVID times. So this is about mortality, scatter radiation, hospital visits, and it doesn't require any special operation theater. And this is especially rare in COVID time. So in conclusion, target IORT given in a risk-adapted approach achieved comparable long-term cancer control, reduced non-breast cancer mortality compared with EBRT. It has advantages in terms of breast quality of life, cosmetically superior outcomes and less pain, is much more convenient for the patient, less travel time, and is lower cost to the patient and healthcare system. But of course, it makes less money to the hospital. And eligible patients should be offered target IOR as a one-stop option during their lumpectomy for breast cancer. It should be discussed with the patients before they have the operation, right? Now, it has been adopted around the world. So these are photographs of users of target IORT around the world. This was a user meeting in US. This was in Mannheim, in Germany. This was in Bangkok four years ago. This was in again in the US and in Mannheim two years ago. And we had, I don't have the photograph of last year, but this year we, we are not going to have the meeting. And this is an analysis of data which is submitted for publication. Over 250 centers in 38 countries have been offered target IRT for breast cancer. There are 260 centers actually. And the total number of patients which they have reported to me directly are 45,000 patients, 44,750. And you can see the centers are in the US, about 74 centers in US, about 60 centers in, the, in Germany, and there are centers in China, Australia, South Africa, and South America. And there are two centers in India, one in Hyderabad and one in Bombay. But the first center in India was in Hyderabad in 2009, where I participated in, in treating two patients. But since then it is not being used because the team moved away and in Raheja hospital, uh, the machine is still there, but I don't believe it is being used. But I, I really would strongly want this to be used because my whole point of starting this project 20 years ago was because patients in India would have a mastectomy unnecessarily. So I really am keen for this to be used in India. In UK, the UK NICE recommended target IOR in 2018 and uh, it was in newspapers everywhere. And this time it made the front page of the Times along with what we didn't know at that time with Joe Biden and the president, the president elect. Um, and it was tweeted by Astro um, in October. 
patients really want this to be had is they are very, very keen. Um, these are some of the patients saying how, how it is good for them. And we all, after all, want to do things for patients. And main, most people who do Ayurvedic, this was a journal club by Radiation Nation in September, where most patients who do I, uh, PPI were giving IORT. And the main problem was machine purchase. But the calculation is if you treat about 30 to 40 patients a year, uh, then uh, within three years, you would get back all the money. And this is a, uh, a patient uh, who is saying this. So I'll finish my talk with that. I'm Marcel Bernstein. Eight years ago, I was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer. I had it for two months only before I was cured. I had target IORT at the same time as the operation to remove the cancer. I spent one night in hospital and I was back at work within days. No pain at any time, no complications, no scarring. I can't even tell where on my breast the surgery was and no recurrence, eight years. And that isn't just me being lucky. Studies show that my experience is similar to that of other women who've had target. I am so happy I was able to have this treatment. Okay. So um, the target B trial is quite separate. It is for high risk patients who are under 45 or high risk. It's a currently uh, trial is running and we expect this to be a superior treatment with reduction in um, local recurrence and probably reduction in mortality. And this trial is currently running. We are expecting to recruit nearly 1,800 patients. 1,300 have been randomized already in 38 countries. And if any of you are really keen, we would like to, uh, to participate in this trial. Uh, it's simple. All those not suitable for target A are suitable for B. Uh, post new adjuvant chemotherapy are suitable. So that is what is eligible. That's how it's running. And um, thank you very much. So I'm happy to take questions. I think I went longer than 25 minutes. Uh, thank you, Jayant. Uh, this is um, Geeta here. We have okay. invited you for a similar talk, but I don't know whether it is, uh, you know, <laughs> it is good to go with that again, because we already have the same audience here who have already heard your talk. And there was another one, I think about four weeks ago when you had done it with focused uh, reviews. All oh, right. Yes, 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 yes. But uh, the, new, the slides which are new are the latter ones. The latter ones, okay. The yeah. ones comparing it with other types of um, PBI, the table, and uh, some of the other slides are different. And I hope people were not bored. No, no, it is very interesting. I think you, know, you would probably get comments saying, uh, oh, come on, don't say the same thing, whatever. I'm yeah. sure something new always catches the imagination, and especially these are young, uh, you know, these are young, budding, budding young oncologists who always yeah. want to know what is, uh, what is new. So uh, let me, you know, there are some questions here and then maybe I can ask you some as well. And uh, the first one is uh, with the results of fast forward trial throwing up yeah. data that one week is can, feasible yeah. and for partial breast, even fractionation such as 22.5 gray in three fractions being tested. Uh, so do you think the cost benefit will hold in the future, especially in a country like India? Yeah, so one thing is definite is uh, we have shown how fast forward is actually a quarter of patient getting a hard breast is not at all a good thing. And um, it is not five fractions, it's not five visits, it's seven visits at least, and a quarter of them get a boost. So that would mean 15 visits. So it is not a single visit, rather it's not zero visit, that, that's what happens with uh, IOT in, uh, it's no, that's 80% of patients just don't have any extra visits at all. One thing is crucial, is the hospital, unless they charge the same amount of money for giving IORT, will certainly make less money if you give IORT. And if incentive of the hospital is to make money, then of course, in the UK, five fractions fast forward is paid three times more than the 15 fraction standard radiotherapy. Okay, because it is IMRT. So, you're paid more to give five fractions. And of course, you don't get paid much if you give IORT. And that should never ever be a criteria to choose a treatment. 
And if you know the randomized trial proves that for the patient, what should be done is, that's what GMC guidelines are now. Patient should be given the choice. What would a patient want to finish their radiotherapy 80% of the times in the operation theater? And now if you do better selection, it is even 90%. You don't have to come back for radiation. If you need to come back, it is a shorter duration. And that's all. And you may get better outcome with that. So as far as patient is confirmed, whenever any new treatment is given, okay, it's strange that we ask about cost effectiveness. If you give Herceptin for a two or 3% benefit in survival, you pay more money, right? Yeah. And here you want to save money at the same time, get some benefit. <laughs> so I find it strange that it needs to be cheaper. It happens to be cheaper. And strangely that has worked opposite way. I always said it is cheaper is a good thing, but that is good for NHS and for insurance companies. What is strange is in Australia, they found that all the insurance company very much want to give IORT because it is cheaper for them. Right. Once they understood it, they want to use IORT. And that's what will happen with Obamacare in the UK. If the Obamacare continues, then uh, anybody who is sponsoring the treatment will want to give treatment which is less expensive and as effective. And for the patient, it is more convenient and they don't have to travel. Somebody has to take them by car, come back every day. Even if it's 15 visits, even if it's 10 visits, it is visits to the hospital. Nobody likes to go to the hospital. And here you, you don't have to have an extra visit 80% of the times. But I think so you that, is the, that is the point. In terms of the cost, the cost of getting the machine is there. It's a capital cost. But there are systems in which that company might, might make, a, make a difference to India. And uh, there may be ways of leasing it or whatever. Because every time uh, the amount of saving that whoever is paying for it, if the insurance company is paying for it, they will save money every time a patient is treated. And that is the way we have to look at it. As a society, after all, even if it's insurance, we all pay for the treatment. Right. So, but the, old, the yes, thing I is you know, that in uh, UK, you do get a lot of these early breast cancers. And so is the case with um, US where you get a lot of these screen detected cancers where you can really, you know, so the population to which IORT can be applied is much larger than what you would see in India where you still see, you know, 60%. Well, I would... I would take objection to that because the population in India, which is suitable for IORT, is probably 10 times more than what the population is in the UK. That's because India, the population larger, is bigger. Because the firstly, pop, larger population. Secondly, you only need to have a patient who is suitable for breast conserving surgery. That is all that's required. But I what? always think that the, the amount of that's tissue- They're not low risk. They're not low risk. Because Which your why, limit is five centimeters, you know, and beyond that, you really. No, but three and a half, but, be, but you norm, normally for patients who have got tumor size more than three and a half centimeters, patients don't always have a lumpectomy. No. You see, most of the times, patients who have a lumpectomy, their tumor sizes are less than three and a half centimeters. Yeah. Even but in I'm India, sure wherever you're going in the world. You know, with yeah. her two positives and triple negatives, you possibly land up giving chemotherapy even in. Yeah, well, that is another, that's another lecture that I would like to give. Uh, but uh, leaving that aside, if patient is having surgery for breast cancer, where they're having breast conserving surgery in India, most tumors will be less than three and a half centimeters in size. And they all would be eligible to have IORT unless they're lobular cancers. If there are multiple positive nodes, for lobular carcinomas, although there is this thing that, you know, it may be... Uh, well, yeah, I know. We had excluded them at that time because of the Christie Hospital trial. That was the only trial that was available at the time when we started. And they had found higher incidence of local recurrence if there were lobular cancers given local radiation. That's why we excluded them. But 60 patients were still there in the trial. Okay. And of those 60, only 30 got whole breast. And none of the recurrences happened among the lobular cancers. So it may work for lobular cancers nowadays when we find small ones, but the lobular cancer spreading all over the breast, we don't want to give them. So that's right. Uh, yeah. So the other thing is about this node positivity. So yeah. about 22% of your uh, patients, were, positive, patients yeah. were positive. So yeah. now there is a contradiction here. Here you have, you know, increased your, uh, you know, even if there is a node, single node positivity, you're doing external beam radiation. No, we're uh, not. So we are not. So what it is, is of those positive node patients, only two thirds of them got whole breast radiotherapy. 
So have you looked at them? Uh, you know, if any. No, sorry, sorry, other way around. Only two, only one third of them got whole breast radiotherapy. So sixty-seven percent of node positive patients did not get any more radiotherapy. And how did that subset do? The uh, node. Very well. No problem. No problem. So patients who received IORT alone did as well as those who got both. So okay. patients who did IORT alone versus EBRT, local control was the same. Have, in a way, it also, yeah. also amounts to saying that if you're a node positive, you don't even need EBRT, you know, even because, you know, we are irradiating patients who undergo mastectomy with one node positivity, you're doing an external beam radiation therapy. That so, is not yet proven though. That is unproven. Supremo trial is not yet published. Supremo trial has been going on and on for ages. I think it's about 17, 18 years now. And I, we still I have know. You know, not heard of the from them. And so, we, so we don't know whether one, two, three nodes makes a difference or not. So if it's we just rely on EBCTCG meta-analysis, which says there is a survival benefit with even one node positive. So, you know. Uh, so that's fine. So it may be there. So if the node is positive, you, if you give whole breast, then that's fine. But our patients didn't receive it. And despite that, there was no worse survival. In fact, there was better survival. So we don't, in the type of patients in the ABCTCG multiple positive nodes in the Danish trials were probably very much large patients with big cancers with internal node positivity and so on and so forth. So internal memory nodes. So I think that was a different group of patients. Patients we see in the clinics today are not that bad. Not that bad, yeah. So there is another question which says, you know, while we're talking about IORT, there is also this gamma pod. So, uh, you know, uh, how does it compare? Oh, gamma pod? Yeah. Oh, this is something I don't know about. What is so gamma? I, I have recently... Please educate uh, me. Sorry. Uh, I recently oh. read about this gamma pod, but I am not very sure I'd be the, ri uh, the right person to talk about it. Uh, I thought... Gamma would... pod, stereotactic body irradiation, SBRT. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. SBRT, principle of stereotactic irradiation. Well, okay. Well, I don't have a problem. Uh, gamma pod should be tested in a randomized trial and 20 years later we can start using it yeah so what is strange is fast forward was pushed for during covid times with five year follow up when they had big objections to target iort when we had five year follow up <laughs> and that was pushed even before it was published so so, so did you see an up increase uptake in uh, you know iort or target uh, around the world yes times? During yeah, around the world, around the world, the proportion of patients getting IOT has gone up. Okay. Wherever the centers are using it, for Italy, for example, the number of cancers reduced because screening reduced. So but the once you were done with, uh, you know, the target has been done. You, the, you know, you don't wait for pathology reports, obviously, because you're doing it intraoperative. Yeah. And if you were to get a margin positive, what would you do then? So if the margins are positive, which happened in about eight percent of patients in the target trial which is what we would expect. And that's my similar positivity rate, six or 7%. Um, you would go back and re-excise as usual. And the protocol specifies you have to give whole breast after that. Yes. So that is the reason why 20% got whole breast. Uh, and actually, if you take away Germany, the number is only 15%. Germany was a strange rule for first few years where if the margin is one centimeter or less, they would consider it as positive margins, which was quite terrible. And finally, they have been convinced and they don't do it now. But, but that was, a it was happening at around that time when one centimeter was considered to be adequate margin. Because which, is why, which is why we got 20% of uh, average. In Germany, it was much higher. But, but I, I went to the center in Hamburg where they were doing this excision and I was really you know, amazed at the way they were doing it. So they have this little instrument, which is like a claw, you know? Yeah. They position that claw like thing under the lump and then just go grrr around it, you know, with a cautery. <laughs> <laughs> Not the so way I, I do it. What yeah. is going to happen to the margin? My heart used to be in my mouth and I used to think. But, you know, sometimes I think there is this tendency to fit a technology into, uh, you know, that situation by doing lesser, which actually may be quite. Uh, to the detriment of the patient and outcome. So I, I'm not sure whether, whether that was the right way of doing it, but I'm sure he's indicated in some way because since the margin has come down from a possible centimeter to ink on, uh, you know, on tumor. Yeah. So yeah. I think probably his, uh, the way he was doing it was vindicated by that margin because I did not see any ways that he could have got away without a, with, with a negative margin. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I think that is the so margin has got many other things, but I think in general it has not caused a problem. So you have also trashed the uh, you know the idea of you know about sixty percent of uh, uh, foci being in that index quadrant beyond what you excise. So about sixty percent of either in C two or you know even some foci of invasive carcinoma <laughs> could be present. So uh, this trashes that also that as as non significant because had that, that been backwards. significant. Uh, we would have had seen mo much more recurrences than we are actually seeing. Yeah. Uh, so, and, yeah. Not just not just this. All other PBI trials have proven the same thing. So I was just looking at your uh, your non inferiority is two point five percent. Elliot was seven percent, but actually, even if you go up to a ten percent, it, it is fine. So what? Yeah. How did you decide it is two point five percent and it was seven well, percent for Elliot? Well, we said well, Elliot is two point five percent is we took that because we believed in this four is to one ratio. And we said, uh, if it is, it, four is to one ratio doesn't work below 10% normally. It only works above 10% difference, absolute difference. So we said, okay, let us apply it for 4%. If the difference was 4%, we would have 1% difference in mortality, okay? And we said 1% difference, patients take chemotherapy for it sometimes. So one four percent is too much. So we brought it down to two and a half percent where it would be 0.6%. So we said, well, that is no way will impact mortality. That's why we kept two and a half percent, which seemed to be now all other trials copied what we have done. And uh, our non-inferiority margin is actually the, the most stringent of all PBI trials. So okay. it can't be a uh, saying that it is not 2.5. But you see, finally, what matters is what we actually found. What we actually found is there was no difference in local control the local recurrence difference was 1% in a negative way, but 1% in the positive way was for the survival. So one death less, one more local recurrence and patients will normally choose mortality. So what local control was the same between the two arms of the trial. And 1% uh, difference patients say, well, 1% versus 2%, are you joking? It's doubling? It's not doubling, it's 1% difference. So uh, that is at five years. So uh, would you have taken uh, the, you know, biological parameters uh, into consideration other than you said lobular, but other than that, the ERPR positivity or a triple negative or a HER2 positivity. So in, have you seen any difference if you've done a subset analysis as to whether there is any difference in the local recurrence? So we have done a subgroup analysis and it is sent for publication. So I can't really reveal it, Close it but okay. it is not, uh, it is not, not making a difference. Not much of a difference, yeah. Because there is a lot of talk now about triple negative, even if it is a smaller tumor, should you be giving a radiation in that situation, even in a uh, in a T two, um, you know, because you are you you would give for a mastectomy for a mastectomy. Yes, uh, there is a there is a trial I think going on in uh, Tata. All right. Where they're talking about triple negative breast cancer, smaller tumors, and still giving them radiation just because it is a. Yeah, but that is a very interesting point because. Generally, patient tumors which are more aggressive, grade triple negative and grade three and so on, there the harm is from distant disease, right? More than local disease. Uh, so it is like the the the, 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 the shed, shed, we are closing the shed door after they have flown the, away. The horse is bolted. <laughs> the horse is bolted. So it is. Um, yeah, I am not sure there is a sense in that. Yeah. Yes. So if if the so triple negatives, I I always believe that there are two kinds of triple negative: ones which behave extremely well, and the others which behave extremely badly. Yeah. So I don't think you make a huge impact on those who are going to behave badly. They would do that irrespective of what you were to do locally, and the ones who were to do well would do well irrespective of what you, what you do locally. So either ways, it doesn't work. Yeah. So, so in that way, that philosophy actually works that for good prognosis patients, local treatment should be very good. Yes. Because there, that can fail and then that would be, you're not going to die from distant disease. You're going to increase that chance by bad local treatment. There is somebody who's asking me how many BCS surgeries per day is usually done in your center with IORT? Well, it depends. This, this COVID times have changed a bit. So around the world, I mean, in the most busy center, it is one or two a week. That's what is usually the case. Right. So, and uh, I thought you talked BCS when you said DCIS is yet another point. We didn't include DCIS in our trial. It's not relevant in India, actually. 
because there is no screening luckily um and uh, <laughs> so dcis is something which uh, dennis holmes has done a series where we excluded dcis because usually 20 years ago dcis used to be spreading all over the segment but today we are finding dcis which are tiny 2 3 mm tumors for them giving whole breast seems such a wrong thing to do so um, we can't do a trial will require 20000 patients so the dcis giving iort doesn't seem a wrong idea if it's just localized so if it is a, so again dcis you possibly need to categorize it again if whether it is you know probably you need to look at her2 also because you know till now we were not very concerned about her2 in dcis Yes. but if it is a dcis which is her2 positive tends to be more but you most know, dcis is low and grade 3 and yeah. high grade yeah so would you consider uh, you know treating them with radiation if it is a grade 3 dcis and leave the low grades and the intermediate grades alone well for low grade at present the trial is going on for treat not treating at all loris lord loris trial and other trials uh, the for me, uh, intermediate and high grade high grade dcis most most people are opting to give whole breast radiotherapy you see if you give them iort if they are small then at least if they get a recurrence you don't have to do a mastectomy because at present if you give whole breast radiotherapy for dcis they get a recurrence then you do whole mastectomy and uh, people diagnosed in their 50s then at 60s they'll get a mastectomy which is not nice thing yeah. so we are considering doing a registry study of dcis treated with uh, iort right thank you excellent uh, excellent exposition as always it's always a pleasure to hear you and i really love your take on new adjuvant chemotherapy in all kind of cancers so <laughs> i always always acknowledge you and quote you because i think i completely agree with it because you know being surgeons we look at it differently as compared to what medical oncologists look at things so i think it's a great take and i and if there are student uh, then i will i will request the students to just read that paper which uh, Jayanth has written on how you should rationalize giving new adjuvant therapy for all breast cancers. It's almost coming to that because it's all pretty industry driven, and you know we we need to be very cautious about what we are doing. Uh, so great talk again, uh, Jayanth, and I am really happy to have moderated this session, and I'm sure the That's students great. all uh, gained a lot out of this. Yeah, we are. I'm I'm, I'm speaking to Apollo at some point. next week or maybe say later this week um and to, they are, they are keen on this so it may be take up in india yeah okay okay great thank you bye bye thank you so much sir it was pleasure hearing you and thank you ma'am for wonderful moderation of the session and uh, sir we look forward to more sessions from you and uh, thank you thank you once again thank you thank you yeah you could have a session on thank new you, <laughs> i will have that you know because i because you have already done this target i think we will change it to that new adjuvant thing it will be an interesting thing maybe we could have a debate yeah. <laughs> we'll have a med medical oncologist pitted against you i think you should you know <laughs> you could invite bhavna you could invite bhavna sirohi oh brilliant i think that's a yeah. great idea it's a she, great she was idea a co -author. she was a co-author of the paper Yeah, yeah. So we will, yeah. So the two of us can come at loggerheads with each other. I think. I, no, no. We are not loggerheads with each other. She agrees with me. <laughs> she agrees with you. Then there is no point. I am not having her on board. I am going to have somebody who is against you. Who says? Have someone else. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll get somebody against uh, that motion, and we are planning a debate uh, session in uh, because we run the Cancer Academy, quite similar to what uh, Navneet is doing a great job of doing these classes for students in these in these times. and i think we've all discovered this passion for learning because of covid you know because it's so much easier so um so we will be doing that i think that's a great idea because i think we have done target twice over so we will do that with you sometime uh, okay. later this okay. year on the beginning of the new year okay Thank i you. don't know whether i can answer these questions which are here how was the node address then millimeter uh, how was the skin manner skin could be pulled out a little bit um non inferiority was included in your uh, talk so that's why i didn't take them Okay that's fine yeah okay thank you yeah okay thank you that's thank finished. you thank you okay well adoption of it is dependent on all of you <laughs> <laughs> i'll help as much as i can i'm keen yes okay, thank you thank you thank you so much bye 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 bye, -bye.